So, Michael Knowles has a video that is up on the Young America's Foundation called The Left's Religion. Now, I wasn't aware that I had a religion. I was aware I was left, but, you know, not that latter part. But, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this particular video. Knowles makes the theological case against transgenderism. Uh, let me go ahead and make the theological case for transgenderism real quick. God made you trans. There. That, that's all I gotta do. Eh, we're done. That's it. That's the end of the video, guys. Insert end of the video tagline here. Oh, also, Shadow Thirst, thank you for redeeming your points for... Uh, da, da. I guess we're not done yet. Let's go. I want to make the strongest case I possibly can for transgenderism. But we are leaving the realm of biology. We are leaving the realm of the natural sciences. We are now entering into the realm of theology. Why does he sound so modulated? Is Knowles finally talking about mommy milkers? Oh, never mind. It's just anti-trans stuff. So I've never seen this guy. I just know the meme. He's the guy that said that we need to eliminate transgenderism. He's the guy that said we need to eliminate transgenderism, which, you know, is just a call for genocide. That's really all it is. Oh, no, I said the G word in the first minute and a half of my YouTube video. Daddy YouTube's going to spank me now. Please go to Patreon or something, because, like, YouTube's not paying all the bills. Most transgender activists refuse to do this because they don't take theology very seriously. They think that theology is just a bunch of make-believe. They think that... I, I'm not going to lie. As a... As an atheist, there are two sides to theology. There is the side of it that is literally make shit up. I'm, I'm dead serious. You are, you are literally making shit up or building off of shit other people made up. Now, granted, granted, there's another side to this, though. Theology can also be just the building blocks for how to structure your life. For what you deem is right and wrong and what you deem is acceptable and unacceptable and the lore behind the characters you believe in. Said, hey, now I happen to be a theologian. Understandable, which is why I said there's two sides to this. There are the people who use theology as a mask to literally just make shit up. They get to be anti-gay and then hide behind the buzzword of theology to pretend that that's the reason why they're anti-gay or anti-trans. Hell. I had to deal with my own shit where there were people around me who were against dating black people and they tried to use the Bible to justify that particular case. There is literally that side of theology that is just making shit up. But there is also the side to it that is structure, that is happiness for a lot of people. It's a comfort for a lot of people. There's also just in general tons of people who do not use theology to make shit up, who do not use it to engage in harm. I don't have a problem with theology when it isn't used to engage in harm. But it seems like I'm about to uh, pop into one of those scenarios where it is used to engage in harm. So let's see what this is. That it's a bunch of unfalsifiable fantasies, totally divorced from the intellectual rigor of science with a capital S. I mean, theology is literally, in fact, unverifiable. I'm, I'm sorry, but if your theology relies on a deity, I can't verify that. I I can't. Like, that's not an untrue statement. And anybody who is an expert theologian, an honest one at the very least, should agree with that. It's not verifiable. This is one of the reasons why Christians are so gung-ho on the idea of faith. It is ironic, of course, that people who believe that men can become women would accuse anybody else of magical thinking, but there it is. Okay, so here's the thing. When you operate with a definition of man or woman that only includes people who were born with a particular set of genitalia, then sure, that's not a category that can change. 
But if you have a broader, and in many cases more accurate definition, not a more narrow definition, of what is a man and what is a woman, then yeah, it's perfectly fine for one to just change from one to another. If you're, if genitalia is the marker you care about, then genitalia is something we can actually change. If physicality, if the way the body looks, if the way the person sounds, if those are the things you care about, guess what? We can change all of those things too. Just HRT alone will do things like make it to where a penis gets incredibly small or a vul or a uh, a clitoris will get large enough to just be its own proto penis like those are things that happen just with HRT no surgeries involved the voice changes are something that can happen also without any surgeries whatsoever that one's just down to practice that one's just down to using your vocal range Agamotto says, Faith is the crutch of a weak-minded fool. I don't agree with that, actually. I don't. Because I don't find people who are religious to be weak-minded. I find that to be very, very disingenuous. There are plenty of people who can use faith as a crutch. But to say that it is just a crutch, to say that people who use it are weak-minded fools, I disagree with that framing entirely. My focus is less on any of that and more about harm. I care what people are using that faith to do. And if people are just using that faith to navigate life more happily, then I don't care. If people are using that faith as a cudgel to just bludgeon people with, then suddenly I start caring. I said, but you can't change chromosomes? Yeah, nor can you fucking check them. If you're a person on the street, I doubt you're just walking around with a syringe, jamming it into every person you find so that you can take their D uh, you can take a sample of their DNA and test their shit to see what their chromosomal alignment is. I doubt you're doing that. And so if you're not doing that, if you're if you're not willing to do that shit, then I'm sorry, you don't actually care about chromosomes. You bring it up because it's an easy shield to hide behind, but you don't actually care about those things because you can't see those things and they don't affect anything for you. Also, I just realized I've been doing this entire thing in the maid outfit. Anyway. <laughs> so there isn't even a biological binary? Nope, there's not. Humans are, but human sexes are bimodal. Gender is a spectrum. Human sexes are bimodal. I mean, technically gender is also bimodal, but you understand what I mean. Many variations in chromosomal makeup like XXY or uh, gene expressions, things like Klein filters. Yeah, all that shit. So I don't have chromosomes. I can only form <laughs> aluminum zones. They do so because they don't understand theology, which is faith seeking understanding. Theology actually is the opposite of make-believe and fantasizing. Mm, no, not really. It's part and parcel. There's an aspect of theology that will always be making part of it up because there is no check and balance for you making it up. If you don't agree with me, then I want you to do, uh, do yourself a favor. Go on to YouTube and look up any Christian versus Christian debate. These are two people who will be working off of the same theological text, and they will have come to two different conclusions about that theological text, and they will come and argue with each other for an hour or two to inconclusiveness. There will be no conclusion to their actual argument. They will simply have it, and then they'll continue having it forever. There is no part of me that can believe that those two Christians working on the exact same bit of theology are not making something up. One of them, or both of them, have to be able to be wrong. And that person that is wrong, whomever it may be, hip-fired, made some shit up. That's how that works. This isn't to say that all of theology is. Sometimes theology is somebody made shit up thousands of years ago. And now you're using it as canon. Said so two Christians can disagree on Psalms. Yeah. Just as natural science is the rigorous contemplation of the physical world, so too theology is the rigorous and logical contemplation of faith and the metaphysical world. N no, it's not the contemplation of faith in the medical physical world. Usually the faith is its own thing. The contemplation has to do with texts. The contemplation has to do with lore. 
The contemplation has less to do with your own faith than it has to do with the writings around your faith. Transgenderism. I want to make the strongest case I possibly can for transgenderism. No, you don't, but continue. Transgenderism in its most coherent form, not saying much, but this is the most coherent form you can get, is a fundamentally religious movement that makes... No, there's nothing religious about being transgender. And transgenderism isn't a thing. There's no ideology there. What? Three claims about the relationship of the body to the soul. One, the trans being trans says nothing about the soul. D damn near nobody I know who's trans uses a soul as part of their argument for being trans. The body and the soul are entirely separate and therefore can be in conflict with one another. Two, that our true identity, our authentic self, is our soul. It has nothing to do with our bodies. It has everything to do with our souls. And three. It, again, it really has nothing to do with your soul. Like, mo I don't know that many trans people that even believe a soul exists. When our bodies and our souls are in conflict, we must reject our bodies and we must entirely embrace our souls, even to the point of mutilating our bodies to better accord with our soul. Okay, so let's go ahead and parse that real quick. Mutilating your body to better align with your soul. That's him basically saying taking any type of gender-affirming surgery to more align with your identity. He can keep saying soul, but the word he's looking for is identity. But okay. Those are the three best points I can give you for transgenderism. They're not new. This, it seems like a new idea, but it's actually not a new idea. At least he agrees that being trans isn't new. People have been doing things to affirm their own particular gender for centuries. Understood in this way, transgenderism is nothing more than an ancient heresy known as Gnostic dualism. What? I I'm sorry, what? What? <laughs> the fuck? So do the points also swallow? So Gnostics believe that there's a dualism between God and the physical world. That, that's, that's it. That's it. They believe that a material world can be created by an imperfect, but a divine being. That's, that's a, that is a Gnostic belief. Creator divinity is not stuck with being a tri-omni perfect god. Most Christian doctrine believes that there is one god and that god is perfectly this, perfectly that, perfectly the other thing. They believe that that god is perfect in every possible way and omni in every possible way. Omni powerful, omni benevolent, omni present, all of those things. However, I don't think there's a single damn thing about being transgender that has anything to do with a Gnostic belief. I, I don't. I really don't. I don't think there's anything that they have to, that, that aligns with that. The idea that... There are, there are trans people who are Christian. There are trans people who are pagan. There are trans people who are atheists. The transness is separate from their religious beliefs. Being trans is not a religion. Calling being trans a religion is a way to try to bring that particular part of somebody's identity down to your level. People can change their religion, but people can't really change whether or not they're trans. Gnostic dualism has held that the physical world is an evil facade that must be rejected for the pure and secret world beyond matter. This heresy has gone by lots of names over the centuries, Gnosticism, Manichaeism in the third century, Albigensianism in the 12th century. It keeps cropping up. There are okay, so I'm not going to deny that Michael Knowles understands a decent bit about Gnostic philosophy. I'm not going to try to deny that. 
there's a trick that he's playing here, though. There's a trick that he's able to play very, very well here. And I want you guys to notice it. He's going to move any conversation about trans people and their rights away from what it should be, which is a conversation about human rights, a conversation about equal treatment, a conversation about people being treated like human beings. He moves the conversation away from that in order to move it instead into a realm that he can argue probably better than most people. A realm of theology. Because the thing is, when we're talking about identity, we're not talking about something that you can argue for or against very easily. Because I can't find your identity in the brain. I can't find your identity somewhere. But what I can do is I can poke holes in theology. And because I can poke holes in theology, I know that Michael knows that he can poke holes in theology. So his plan here is to take something that is rooted in identity, in personal human experience, and move it into the realm of something closer to dogma so that it's easier for him and his audience to understand it and therefore strike it down. It's a very, very good move. Politically speaking, because while we can look look at this, listen to it and go, wow, that's a crock of horse shit. That's all horse shit. His audience, on the other hand, this is the part that I think you guys need to pay attention to. His audience are listening to that and they are taking it in. They're internalizing that. This is an argument that resonates with them. He paints it like he's steel manning being transgender. When instead he's completely painting over it with a broad brush that doesn't accurately represent what being trans is. Hell, I can't even accurately represent what being trans is because I'm cis. Most I can say is I'm gender apathetic. I, I see myself in any, like type of dress, garb, or what have you, and as long as I look okay in it, I don't care past that. This is why I don't mind playing female characters in video games, using a female avatar on stream. I'll dress perfectly masculine when I'm out and about, because I think that's the clothes I look better in. But outside of that, I just don't care. So art can be anywhere from $20 to... Okay, that's something different. Said, so you don't care if you wear a Sonic onesie? I need to actually do the Sonic onesie stream. I keep being in a position where it's just not comfortable for me to do it. But I do owe you guys a Sonic onesie stream. But continuing on here. The point I wanted to make, mostly, wasn't that, oh, we can dunk on Michael Knowles to say he's wrong. Well, no, he might be right about what he's saying about Gnosticism. He's mo He's taking being transgender, switching it in play. He's literally bait and switching it with the idea of Gnostic faith. And after bait and switching it with Gnostic faith, appealing to an audience that already believes that Gnosticism is heretical, that it's anti-Christian, that it's bad, that it's evil, that it's of the devil. And now that he's moved into that category, he can now demonstrate that being trans is bad and wrong by telling people what they already want to hear about Gnosticism. For different variations, but it's always the same tune. Like transgenderism, all of these heresies were not primarily popular with the common people. All of these heresies throughout all of history were of course popular with the intellectuals. Only an intellectual could be so stupid as to believe these heresies. I was reminded of this. God, isn't it so weird? That he literally gets to say, hey, these things were popular with smart people, and we don't like smart people. Ignore the fact that I'm on the stage trying to sound like a smart people. We don't like smart people here. Just, okay. It's the other day, when Judge Katanji Jackson- So do you want a, uh, you want a meme of Michael Dole's getting trans teddy slap? I guarantee you, this man has ordered, at the very least, two trans escorts. And he has gobbled their dicks up. Jackson was uh, in her confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court. She was asked a question by Marsha Blackburn on this topic. Senator Blackburn said, well, what is a woman? Can you define what a woman is? And Anybody who identifies as a woman. 
What is a gamer? Somebody who identifies as a gamer. What is a woman? Somebody who identifies as a woman. Like, if it's a matter of identity, then literally the defining factor is whether you identify as it. And Katanji Jack, Judge Jackson, a federal judge, laughed. She said, of course I can't. I, I'm not a biologist. I can't tell you what a woman is. Katanji. A woman is a social category that we created that broadly, but not all the time, reflects a sexed category of female. A woman is a social category. It's a set of expectations, both in physicality and in mannerism. What those expectations are change by society, but broadly speaking, they are what we would call, in umbrella terms, feminine traits. People who not only ex uh, exacerbate, not exacerbate, but people who not only exude these traits, both physically and mentally and socially, but also identify with the femininity of those traits, both in both in gender and otherwise, those are women. There can be conversations about whether they should be acting more feminine, whether they should be taking steps to transition. That's not the conversation for here. The conversation for here is what makes somebody a woman? What makes them identify as that? And again, broadly speaking, woman is a descriptive category that embodies both physicality, and that's not just talking about what's between your legs, that's also how somebody presents, how their body is shaped, etc. And the social things that that person is expected to do or be. Somebody who embodies mostly what we would consider masculine traits, again, those things change based on culture, but somebody who embodies more of those traits physically and also mentally and also socially is probably going to be a guy. Somebody who embodies the opposite of those traits is probably going to be a girl. And there are people who, because there are so many of these variables, will fall somewhere in between. However, unironically, unironically, I think I can tell you that it is easier to answer what is a man than what is a woman. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, said uh, he can find at least six jobs. If you don't believe that it's easier to identify what is a man than what is a woman, let me prove it to you real quick. I'm going to prove it to you very, very quickly right now. Die, monster. You don't belong in this world. It was not by my hand that I'm once again given flesh. I was called here by humans who wish to pay me tribute. Tribute? You steal men's souls and make them your slaves. Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. Your words are as empty as your soul. Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? Like I said, it's way easier to get down to the brass tacks of what is a man than it is for what is a woman. Just saying. G. Jackson has two degrees from Harvard. Only someone with two degrees from Harvard could be so stupid as to not know what a woman is. Actually, somebody with two degrees from Harvard might be smart enough to recognize when they don't know. You see, this funny thing happens the more knowledge you accumulate. The more stuff you know, the more things you learn, the dumber you feel. Because the more you learn about any subject, the more you'll understand that there's pockets of your information that are missing. There's areas of that subject that you don't know. And the more things you learn about that subject, the more narrow you focus on that subject, the more you realize, oh shit, every other thing that I could possibly know, I know just as little about all of that as I did about this when I started. The more you know, the more you know you don't know about everything it it feels counterintuitive
before you start sitting down and reading books and doing research and having to make fucking bibliographies for shit, it feels counterintuitive. But it's really not. It's really, really not. It's very, very simple. You think that the more you know, the smarter you feel. But the reality is the more you know, the more inept you feel. The more out of depth you feel. The more you understand that the world around you is more complicated than you originally thought when you walked into the conversation. It is literally, as Joker's saying, the opposite of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes. So why do people hate nerds so much? Because it's easier to give a nerd a swirly than to argue with the nerd about why they're wrong. The nerd will beat you in the conversation. Like transgenderism, all of these heresies preached salvation through the attainment of secret knowledge. No, nobody talks about being trans saves you from jack shit. Unless we're talking about trans girls' titties, because, like, that, that can save a man from anything. Just saying. So nerds will become the bosses? Typically, yeah. In our secular age, we would probably prefer the word liberation to salvation. It, substantially, it means the same thing. Mm, no, not really. Liberation just means to be freed. Salvation means to be saved. One can liberate themselves, but somebody can't really save themselves. That's the difference between those two words. That's why they are etymologically different. Liberation implies something that I could achieve on my own. Salvation implies something that somebody else has to grant me. The only way that we can free ourselves from the prison of the body, according to this view, man trapped inside a woman's body, all that sort of language, is through the secret knowledge hidden by the evil physical world. But this Gnostic account of the soul is simply not true. That, That's not an argument against it. You just said it's not true. That's not the way the soul and the body works. The soul doesn't work. It The soul doesn't fucking exist. Until you can actually prove your soul exists, you don't get to talk about how the soul does and doesn't work. I'm sorry. Also, the body does work like that. The body actually works exactly like that. When you wash the body in hormones... That is the thing that causes the physical changes in the body that lead to somebody being more predominantly feminine or more predominantly masculine in their body. Take two people, same age, same weight, and have one of them, let's say they're both male, have one of them take a testosterone blocker or, you know, cut their balls off, one or the other. Have one person take a testosterone blocker and then a supplement of estrogen. It can be estradiol, it can be anything. It doesn't matter here. They take a supplement of estrogen to the equivalent of what their body would normally produce if they were born the other way around. Take those two people, same age, same weight, same everything. You can even have them be the same race and give it one year. One year. After a single year, those two people having the same diet, having everything be identical between the two of them. They can be living the exact same lives, in the same job, on the same weight training regimen. Don't care. You will notice fat distribution changes. You will notice breast growth. You will notice that both of the people will look radically different by the time they're done. For the same reason that we are a sexually dimorphic species, that physical change that we see between men and women... That physical change is brought on primarily by hormones. That's that's the thing that makes it happen. You suppress one hormone and you start pumping the other in, the person will literally go through a second puberty and you will see what is functionally a different person by the time you are done. By the time you've had a year or two of those supplements, those blockers, you will damn near look like a different person. So when you say, that's not how the body works, no, unfortunately for you, that is exactly how the body works. And when you go, that's not how the soul works, my guy, that's not even a fucking thing. But let's conclude. The soul is not, in fact, separate, entirely distinct from the body. The body is not, in fact, a prison for the soul. The soul is the form of the body. The soul is the animating principle of life. 
Sure it is, which is why there's lots of life that people will say doesn't have a soul, and yet is still just as animated. This is not a typical way that we talk about transgenderism. Because no, because it's a disingenuous way. It's an ingenious way if your goal is to turn an army of Christians against trans people, but it's also an incorrect way. Because we've completely thrown theology out the window, but transgenderism can only even possibly be sort of understood as a theological movement. Hence, our, our necessity to apply the rigors of theology to this movement, and it crumbles when you do that. It, it, yeah, because it's a category error. When you engage in a category error... Let me make this make sense easier. Okay, cool. So, when I try to tell you about the sound of purple, it doesn't make sense. It crumbles when I try to talk to you about the sound of purple. That's because purple's not a fucking sound. If I move something away from the category that it's in, if I take purple, which is a color, and I talk about sound, which is something that it is, I understand there are people who actually can hear colors. I forget the word that actually describes that. But, like, the fact of the matter is these are two different things. There are sounds, and then there are colors. There are audio cues, and then there are visual cues. If I try to describe purple only in audio cues, then I'm going to get a different experience for every person I describe it to, because it doesn't make sense that way. Green is not a creative color. So what are you talking about? Purple doesn't have sound? No, it doesn't. Your brain can make an association of a sound with the color purple, just like your brain can see blue and make an association of ocean waves. It can see the color green and make an association of rustling, association of rustling leaves. But sounds do not come from colors. They do not create audio waves. They are wavelengths on the spectrum of light, not sound. Trying to understand one through the medium of the other is always going to cause there to be holes in the descriptions because they are not the same thing. They are not in the same categories. So when you try to describe being transgender through the lens of theology, then of course it's not going to work because it's not a theology. It's merely an identity. It is a social identity one either takes upon themselves or rejects. Axis says purple sounds round. Blue is the best taste. Stuff, I don't need to know about what color crayons you think are the best flavor. But. That was that there. My takeaway from this is, like I said, this is an ingenious way to try to argue against transgender people to a group of people who are primarily concerned with their own religion. You move being transgender into the pocket of religion, and then you talk to an audience of people whose religion necessitates disliking other religions. Because they say well, there's only one true way to salvation, and that's Christ, and so you can't like other religions because the other religions are fake. Then, of course, being transgender is going to be considered a falsehood. It's going to be considered a fake. Because the only thing it can be when you have a monotheistic religion with only one way to do things, only one God, only one true theology that ironically none of y'all can fucking agree on, then you're going to land yourself in this scenario every single time. With the Christians only having the option to hate the trans people. That's all they get to do. Because if being trans is theology, then they don't get to like it. They don't get to appreciate it because it is all going to be considered heretical. It is an ingenious, but absolutely flippant and awful move on the part of Michael Knowles. But I think it's equally important to listen to your enemy's tactics to listen to the things they are saying, and most importantly, understand why they are working, than to just say, well, you're wrong, neener, neener, neither. However, I think it's very important for me to also tell uh, Michael Knowles that you're wrong, neener, neener, neener. Athic shenanigans, thank you for the raid. How was your stream? With that said, though, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. 
Hit the like button if you haven't already, and as always, everybody, insert end of video tagline here. Hey everybody, just wanted to go ahead and showcase a bit of artwork before we conclude things, but this one's a little bit different. It's actually a little song that Grey Wolf decided, decided to make. Decided? Wow, I'm bad at this. I'm going to go ahead and play the song itself, and honestly, this is really, really good and kind of funny. Let's, let's go ahead and take a listen. Apparently, I can commit self cest on myself. Uh... Oh. Well, there's that, I guess. I'm going to go ahead and send you a DM over on Discord because uh, that was that was definitely something. Uh, let's go ahead and close things out. Thank you very much for that. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability that Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. And they would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron... Dren, Jemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Mabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you, Sagitt, I'm not saying that part, and Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.